For this first video for the channel, I'd like to look at some basic genetic concepts. Welcome to the Art of Breeding with Brian Reeder. It's not essential to know any of this. Our ancestors bred for millennia plants and animals without knowing any of this. But they're helpful tools to have in your toolbox. So I'm going to present you with these basic concepts to get started. We're going to look at dominant versus recessive genes, qualitative versus quantitative, polygenic or multigenic traits, major genes, minor genes, also known as modifiers, pleiotropy and linkage, beneficial versus deleterious, environmental influences, and epigenetics. To start with dominant and recessive, most life forms on the planet have two strands of DNA which we call diploid. You can have more strands of DNA, some things are triploid or tetraploid or octoploid or right on up. So at the basic level, diploids have two doses of any given gene, they have two strands of DNA, one dose of a given gene at given gene placements, which are called loci, locus, in any given individual. You can have creatures that have two doses of the same gene, which are called homozygotes, or you can have creatures or plants that have one dose of one gene and one dose of another gene. Those are called alleles at the locus. So the homozygote has two doses of the same allele at the locus, where the heterozygote has one dose of one allele and another dose of the other allele at the gene locus. That's the place where the particular gene is found on the chromosome. The dominant only requires one dose of the gene to be visible in the phenotype, so you'll see it with your eyes even if there's one dose. The recessive gene, however, requires two doses of the same allele or the same gene so that you can see that expressed in the phenotype or see it visually. Dominants are not all created equally. So some dominants have high penetrance, which means they're as strongly visible in the phenotype when they're heterozygous as they are when they're homozygous or nearly so, then you can have low penetrant dominance, low penetrance, which is where you don't see it very strongly if it's a heterozygote and there's only one dose. Okay, so all dominants are not created equal. Um, a recessive, though, people will sometimes say to me, I cross so-and-so with so-and-so, and none of the F1, none of the, uh, the seedlings, none of the offspring showed that I lost my gene you can't lose recessive genes. You might can over time, but they're, it's very hard to get rid of a recessive, actually, and very easy to get rid of a dominant. The dominant, you can always see it. You select the ones that don't have it. You get rid of it. The recessives can be carried indefinitely. To get rid of a recessive gene, you've got to test mate. It's the only way to know they're there. To bring the recessive gene back out when you've crossed a carrier of the homozygous recessive gene that you can see onto the um, non-carrier, you've got to then breed the first generation together or breed an individual from that first generation that does not show the trait but carries it back to either a parent or another individual carrying the trait homozygous. And then you'll see one in four or 50% 1 and 2, depending on which way you take that. If you breed two carriers, you get 1 and 4 that will be homozygous. If you breed a carrier to a homozygote, you'll get 50-50. Though they won't always in practice come out in those exact numbers because randomness will play its part, and so you'll see some variation, but if you look at large enough numbers, you'll see 1 and 4, you'll see 1 and 2, depending on which way you've taken that. The next thing is qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative are the regular Mendelian genes that are dominant or recessive. They're the ones with which you can use a pundit square. Qualitative issues can be counted. You can count how many of this, that, or the other you see. So if you've got one gene and you breed two carriers of the, of the recessive gene together, um, then you're going to see one 
out of four that's homozygous for the gene. You're going to see one out of four that's homozygous for absence of the gene. And you're going to see two out of four or half of them that are 50% carriers. They are heterozygotes. Now, you can make this more and more complicated the more genes you throw into the mix. Uh, like, for instance, if you're dealing with two genes, then the homozygote for two genes will generally be 1 in 16. And that'll hold when you look at large enough numbers, but you generally can't breed 16 and expect that to hold up. Quantitative, though, is where you have multiple genes, major genes and minor genes, dominant and recessives, so that a phenotype is made up by a whole bunch of genes. What that means is that your segregation ratios can be really complicated, so that what you see in practice is a spectrum. Instead of one, two, one, you see a spectrum. So on the ends of the spectrum are the two homozygotes, the homozygote for all the genes, the homozygote for none of the genes, and then in between you have different levels of homozygosity and heterozygosity for the, for the two extremes of phenotype. I said two genes, but it could be multi-genes. For the two extremes of phenotype, most are going to fall on that spectrum. And when you're breeding and working with quantitative genetics, you're constantly each generation wanting to select them a little closer to the extreme side you want them to be on. Okay, They're complicated. They're more difficult to work with. They take a lot more time to get back to a homozygous fully expressed trait if you outcross to a non-carrier. Major genes are like the major dominant and recessive genes where you can have one gene that does its thing. So like if you have one gene of, uh, you know, two doses of the one gene recessive white in chickens, for instance, you'll have white chickens. Um, dominant the same. Um, so, you know, it depends on what the dominant gene is or the, or the recessive gene is as to how it will act if it's dominant or recessive. But you basically, um, you can get gene action from one gene. Now, major genes can also be combined with minor genes. And minor genes are modifiers, are a whole bunch of little genes that gradually, minutely, or in some way change the expression of the major gene. And what you see out of this is if you've got a lot of modification, you may have a really extreme expression of the gene, or you may have a milder expression of the gene. The modifiers change the way the gene, the major gene, expresses. And this falls into quantitative genetics. In quantitative genetics, you may have one or two or three major genes, and then any number of minor genes that are modifying the way they express. We see this really strongly in advanced phenotypes, so like the most extreme versions of a gene expression in the chickens, or in pigeons, or in dogs, for instance. Um, things that do not breed in a simple, straightforward, Mendelian fashion are going to fall into the quantitative spectrum, and that means you're going to have major genes being affected by a, a whole slew of minor genes. Okay, pleiotropy and linkage can appear similar, but they're slightly different. Pleiotropy is where one gene does more than one thing. So let's say, for instance, you have a gene that removes melanin, but then that gene also has a negative effect on the formation of organs in the body. That's pleiotropy. There are a lot of different pleiotropic expressions where one gene does multiple things. That's not possible to separate unless you get a mutation. Okay, so if you've got one of these pleiotropies where one gene does one, two or three or more things, you can't separate those out. Then there's linkage, where several genes are very close to each other on the chromosome, and so they're linked and actually kind of segregate and move together. They don't separate and go out separately very easily, so they look almost like they're a pleiotropy. They move together, yet linkages can be broken. And if you'll raise enough individuals, depending on how tight the linkage is, that linkage can be broken so you can get just the one thing and separate it from the other thing. Beneficial or deleterious. There are genes that help the organism. A beneficial gene is a gene that provides immunity to disease, for instance. A deleterious gene is a gene that weakens the organism. 
Um, it causes illness. It causes what we call inbreeding depression. It is the accumulation of multiple recessive deleterious genes that causes the effect we call inbreeding depression. So you can have genes that are beneficial and genes that are deleterious. The environment can affect the expression of genes. Uh, the environment can change, for instance, during incubation with um, reptiles and even birds to some extent can change the ratio of the sex of the offspring. That's an environmental influence. Environmental influences are more common in plants where, for instance, the temperatures during scape formation will determine the condition of the flowers on daylilies. Um, so if you get a lot of late freezes while the scapes are forming, you may have deformed flowers. Um, that is an environmental influence. And then environmental influences leads into epigenetics. Epigenetics is where the environment influences the organism in such a way that the RNAs and other transposons and other factors that are translating the DNA and actually modifying how it functions, and some of those modifier genes, minor genes that I mentioned earlier, may even fall into the epigenetic category. What they do is they change the expression of the gene often in relation to environmental triggers. In most instances, this has more to do with disease or um, biological function and reproduction than it will with phenotype genes. Phenoty phenotypic genes are not often as influenced by epigenetic factors, especially in animals. They can be a little more in plants. Um, but epigenetics are a branch of genetics that we don't understand as well, yet they're fairly new. They're not something we can go into a huge amount of detail about yet. I mean, I can go into detail later about individual epigenetic effects that are known, but I can't describe them in as broad a sense as I can these more commonly known genetic DNA-based Mendelian factors. But epigenetics exist, and you may run into them. So I just want you to know that that's there. Okay, so that runs down the basic introduction to the most basic concepts. There's a lot of other stuff. I wanted to keep this video at about 14, uh, 15 minutes. We're getting there. So I'm going to close this one for now. We'll discuss these a lot more in the future. Thank you for visiting my channel. I hope this video was interesting to you. If you would like to know more about this subject, leave a comment or question below in the comments section. Please leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell notification to be alerted when new videos post. You can find my poultry books on Amazon at the link below in the show notes. My daylily website, sundragondaylilies.com, offers information on booking me for consultations on your specific genetics questions or mentoring for your breeding projects. It also lists all of my daylily introductions, the cultivars that are currently available, and links to my blog where you can find the bulk of my daylily writing. Thank you for joining me for this video, and I hope you'll be back for more. Have a great day.